Um, thank you so much for inviting me to Sweden for this. I, um, I just was really happy to get the invitation and to be able to share a little bit about the STABLE program. I'm going to go through this talk. We'll introduce you to what is it, for those of you who don't know what it is, which I think is probably a lot of you. Um, a little bit about the program history, and then I'm going to jump into a, a little bit about what each of the modules contain. So with that, um, I want to start out with what does STABLE stand for. I think that's a logical place to start. So. STABLE stands for sugar and safe care, temperature, airway, blood pressure, lab work, and emotional support. And when my daughter was about six years old, I asked her, and she said it was sugar, temperature, airway, blood pressure, love, and excellence. And I thought that would work too. Um, so those are the modules. And uh, as I go through this, I'll kind of introduce what this whole program is all about. So STABLE is an evidence-based approach to the evaluation and assessment of all infants and the immediate management of the sick infant. So it really applies to helping people to understand how does the baby look, does the baby look well, does the baby have risk factors, does the baby you know, now start to look like he's getting sicker, and then if the baby is sick, the program guidelines jump in there and help people understand what they're supposed to do next. So using a mnemonic is with the purpose of helping people to both learn the material and then remember what things they're supposed to do. So it's mnemonic based and there's a very strong emphasis throughout the program on understand, understanding the underlying physiology, what is going to cause this problem. Um, so instead of just saying, you know, very recipe, do this, do this, do this, it's like, what, how is the baby preparing for extra uterine life? Where will things start to go wrong? And then we jump into what the guidelines are. So the overall educational goal then is to try to improve knowledge about neonatal assessment and care. And also, secondarily, uh, to reduce diagnostic and treatment errors and improve patient safety. And I put the little caution bullet on the slide because throughout the STABLE program, you'll find these caution bullets that are intended for the instructor then to emphasize more about what what things people need to pay attention to or here's where errors can happen or here's where you know you need to pay more attention to what's happening and the last main objective is to try to help the improve survival uh, to reduce morbidity and to improve both patient and family outcomes so the program targets that neonatal period the first month of life and its emphasis though is on the early neonatal period so usually the majority of what is taught in the program applies to like a one to two week old baby. And the big aha moment for me was when we did a, um, uh, there was a study, actually I didn't do it, but it was a study out of Nova Scotia, Canada. And they surveyed their students. And one of the survey results was that they said that the program was applicable to the care of well infants. I had always in my mind as the author of the program thought of stable is just if the baby's sick, the program starts. But what they taught uh, me in that survey, it was 160 odd people that answered the survey, was that it helped them to, to assess the patient and to know, you know, if I can do these things, perhaps I can keep the baby out of the NICU. You know, if we can be more um, preventative in our care. And, <clears throat> um, the last thing on this slide talks about the importance of accurate and continuous assessment. So it's not just the initial assessment, but we do remind people throughout the program that here's how the baby looks now, but you have to go back and look and again and again and again. Or if you implement a care for the patient, you need to go back and see what was the effect of that care. How did you impact the baby's uh, course at that point? So stable fits following resuscitation, and I've just taken a, a screenshot of the NRP book and placed it on there. So resuscitation, whether it's delivery room resuscitation or if it's a resuscitation performed in the emergency department or a mother baby suite, um, wherever the resuscitation occurs initially, then the guidelines and stable follow thereafter. So it's not intended to replace resuscitation uh, training. In fact, I get that question fairly frequently from people. They want to not do 
a program and they, they write to me and ask me, can I do stable and not NRP? And I always say, no, you have to do NRP. You have to do resuscitation first. We're not trying to, to teach you the, that important care. You have to participate in that first and then you can take this course. So the educational methodology is that it's a lecture based <clears throat> and it's intended to be interactive with discussion. So the best classes are when the instructor is presenting the material but then telling, uh, you know, case <coughs> based and relating stories that, re you know, memorable events that have happened with babies that are being discussed with cases that are being discussed. And then to have the students asking their good questions and, you know, talking about the babies they had to take care of. So we do really encourage a lot of discussion during the course. The other important premise of this course is that it's taught by experts in neonatal nursing or medicine. And we understand that midwives, for example, have a vast amount of knowledge about um, babies and mothers, but we feel like if you haven't sat in the NICU side by side managing babies, taking care of babies, um, and knowing all the different variations that the babies can bring your way, that that's the kind of expert that we're looking for to teach the course, to be able to interpret the material properly and also answer the questions accurately. And if time allows, we strongly recommend that people incorporate simulation uh, or skills at the very least into the courses. So we can see up here that we've got, um, some, on the left picture, we've got a, um, a stable course where they have gone to the bedside now and they're relating <coughs> the concepts at the bedside using simulation. Uh, the middle picture is a, another scenario that we did that was a gastroschisis patient that was unexpectedly born with gastroschisis and now the baby has aged to four, year, four, four uh, hours old. And then the other scenario, um, on the right hand side is a baby who came through the emergency department at five days old with a critical coarctation and they had to sort out what was causing the baby to be so sick and in shock. <clears throat> the skills based on the learner needs can range anywhere from airway management, giving positive pressure ventilation, um, assisting with endotracheal intubation or securing the endotracheal tube, uh, translumination, needle aspiration, how to set up the needle aspiration equipment, and then something as simple as securing an IV catheter. If that's not something they have to do all the time, then we have a practice session they can do for that. And then also setting up umbilical catheterization. So we focus on based on what the learner needs are. And then for more advanced um, practice nurses and with physicians, then their skills session would be, for example, how to place the umbilical catheter how to place it emergently, how to place it when t more time allows, uh, how to do an intraosseous needle insertion if necessary, and then the pneumothorax evacuation. So there's a course completion card that's awarded to students who attend a full course, and that course is usually taught over a one to two day period. When I teach a learner course, <clears throat> I teach it usually over one and a half days. If they want me to do simulation, then I make it two days. Um, if they don't allow time for simulation, then we usually do some what we call simulets, these little short abbreviated um, targeted simulations that last about 10 minutes. And then we stand there and just do a bedside debrief with the team members that were in this, in this scenario. And we also accept student rosters from our international instructors. And I think that's one of the big differences between stable and NRP is that the neonatal resuscitation program that's administered through the American Academy of Pediatrics will not accept student rosters most often. There's like a, a rare exception. Uh, I think Hong Kong is one of the countries that they'll accept student rosters from for NRP. But we, we feel like if somebody has uh, met our criteria for expertise in nursing or medicine uh, to be a, a stable instructor, they've come through our formal training course and then we've awarded them with that instructor status, then we feel like we will take their rosters because they're going to follow the, the rules as we've outlined. Um, here in Sweden, um, how many are you are from Sweden? Okay, quite a few of you. So you, you may have heard of Stable, but I did receive an um, email from Mary Gustafsson, who is one of our Stable instructors here, and she said here in Sweden um, there have been 240 students in 20 learner courses since January 2014 that they have taught. Uh, that's just her program, and that has included 40 physicians and 100 uh, 200 RNs, 
And then also they're teaching stable to LVNs and nurse, nursing assistant, I think NA would be nursing assistant, is her abbreviation, 123, but they don't award the cards because they give more of an abbreviated course to them. So there's been quite a bit of activity here in Sweden. So how did this stable program start? So I'm the author of the program and I'm the founder of the company. Um, in the 1980s, early 1980s in the U.S., that was the early days of neonatal transport. And there were no formal educational programs in existence to guide neonatal pre-transport stabilization and, and care. And I was a neonatal transport nurse practitioner, and I would oftentimes get to the uh, community hospital setting, to the rural facility, and the nursing staff and the physician staff were always very uncertain, especially the nurses, what to do for the baby. Um, they weren't sure what was wrong with the baby. They weren't sure what, they, what the transport team wanted them to do to prepare the baby for our arrival. They weren't sure if the physician order was a good order or a not very good order, but they carried it out anyway because it was an order. So I created Stable back in 1984 as just a little local outreach education program that I took to my region in Colorado. We had a lot of rural facilities and I taught it all over Colorado and people really enjoyed the course, at least that's what their evaluations indicated. In 1987, the first edition of the, the AAP's NRP was published, and then in 1993, I was getting a master's degree, and I uh, took Stable back off the shelf and dusted it off and went to the literature <coughs> to see whether or not what I intuitively put in the program was what the evidence said you should do to, to prepare these babies for transport. And I revised the, the program, um, added to it. So I went from about a two double-sided page lecture to about a 100-page book, the first, <laughs> you know, by the time the thing was published. Um, in 1996, I formed the Stable Company, and that was because of some poster presentations I'd done about the course, and there were a lot of interest in it. And then in 2001, we had enough people in that five-year period that were teaching stable, that they were coming back to me and saying, how do we recognize participation in the course? We want to, we want to know when somebody needs to be renewed. And so we started this roster program to track student completion. And I'll show you the numbers here in a second of how many people. Uh, 2017, so I skipped a whole bunch of years here to make this <coughs> abbreviated enough. But in May of this year, we just started our 21st year of being um, in existence. So the program is, in, is what we're considering interprofessional participation. We don't want the program to just be for nurses or just be for physicians or just respiratory therapists. We, we feel like nurses across a wide spectrum of disciplines, so all the way from newborn nursery and mother baby through midwives, labor and delivery staff, intensive care nursery, transport, emergency department staff, and then others, uh, practitioners and nurse anesthetists. And then for physicians, um, our, our highest um, physician user group is family practice physicians, so generalist physicians and pediatricians. And uh, we do have neonatology fellows who take the course, but we really feel like when you're at, at that level, you should be teaching the course rather than sitting there as the student. <clears throat> so since the program started tracking <coughs> participation, in January 2001, um, we've had 470,000 students complete the course. And that represents about 49,000, just shy of 49,000 classes. So of those 470,000 students, 355,000 are new students, and then we have 105,000, 506,000 renewing students. So not everybody requires renewal. Some hospitals, especially in the United States, once they've put Place, you know, have people go through stable once, they don't require them to go through again. Other hospitals require stable. If you're gonna work in the nursery or if you're gonna work in the newborn ICU, if you're gonna work in labor and delivery, they have to have a, a current stable card. So it's just quite variable. Uh, for instructors worldwide, we have a total of 4,223 students as of right now. And um, this number has been increasing. You know, last year it was about 4,000 total total instructors, so once you become an instructor, as long as you teach two times in two years, <coughs> your status gets renewed. And so we have some instructors who drop off and you know don't teach anymore, they retire or whatever, And um, but many of them stay with it. So of those 4,000 uh, instructors, 
553 are internationally based instructors, and, and we're pretty happy about that. We'd like to see more, but of course, um, it's a little bit limited. Okay, so here's me. You can see me on the left in the middle. Okay, okay that is me. Um, so I've taught all over the world. I've, and you see all these countries with stable instructors is, are listed out here. So I only included countries that have instructor, uh, instructor base. And so everywhere from Australia all the way through Vietnam, we just finished our countrywide flight of one more class to go in November, but countrywide implementation of stable in Vietnam. Um, so there's a translation in Lithuanian and Latvian from the older edition. Spanish, Romanian, and Farsi in the fifth edition, and Vietnamese in the sixth edition. Translation is very um, time consuming, and, uh, and partly that's because of the, the multiple components in the program, the slides and the book. But if anybody is interested in translation, then you know they come through me, and I usually give them the translation agreement, and then they don't come back, because they see all the steps that have to take place. <laughs> so. Um, but anyway, I, the picture on the left is me in teaching in Malaysia, and then I was in Saudi Arabia this last year teaching, and that was a really uh, interesting and I think very rich experience for me. There's a military mandate now in the United States. Um, that I'm in my 13th year of a contract with the U.S. Navy for instructor training, and then there's a brand new perinatal <coughs> training requirement that just came up in the U.S. Army, and the U.S. Air Force is also part of that. And they're requiring stable is completed every two years to maintain a consistent knowledge base. And I know it's too small to read, but when you open up the slide, <coughs> you can find the details on the slide. <coughs> For the program materials, um, in order to teach a learner course, the instructor needs to have an instructor manual, and the student, each student in the class is supposed to have a student learner manual. And then you can see that there's a slide DVD or there's a USB with all the course slides on it. And in addition to the regular stable materials, there's also a physical assessment, a physical and gestational assessment um, of the newborn program. This is just an optional self-study by Ford presented by the instructor. And I'm just gonna show you a couple slides from each of those components. So we see here that there's a, a whole Ballard gestational age assessment component. And we, we're showing people the differences between you know, the minus one <clears throat> finding all the way through four. And um, you can see, for example, further on in the program, and there's 420 slides in the whole program, so I obviously can't show you all of it today. But we have uh, things that cover the baby from head to toe. So this is a slide from the craniosynostosis section. Uh, we have uh, the abdominal exam and showing here gastroschisis, and then Within all of these different surgical problems, there's a link that you can go to how do you initially stabilize those babies, so gastroschisis, initial management. And then I also am the author of this uh, stable cardiac module, and these are all, uh, these are illustrations from the brand new second edition that I'm completing <clears throat> that I hope to launch the end of this year. And what's made this um, special this time is that, you know, so this is the hypoplastic left heart, illustration and then you can see um, we've got the outside of the heart and then when you click here so this is we're animating the blood flow pattern for all of the different uh, lesions and so this is actually showing the baby who's had a aortic reconstruction and has the sano shunt which is helping to provide the blood flow from his right ventricle up to his pulmonary artery so this is at that stage of repair so it's, uh, I think, what people will really enjoy it. And the last I'm going to round up, just tell you what the content are of the different modules. So <clears throat> for the Sugar and Safe Care module, we introduced that uh, concept with the discussion about safe care. And so we talk about patient safety and error reduction. Um, then we focus a lot on infants who are at increased risk for hypoglycemia. We introduced that concept by how does the baby prepare for extra uterine life? And then mortality and morbidity of late preterm birth, screening for gestational diabetes. So we also can target our information towards a lot of the obstetric staff who are in the classes who are working with these moms day in and day out. And we discuss aerobic and anaerobic metabolism, initial IV fluid therapy, and then 
how to monitor for and treat hypoglycemia. And after that, we move ourselves into the umbilical catheter discussion. And it says causes of bowel obstruction as the last bullet, but that comes earlier on in the module. <coughs> so here's the like factors impacting glucose levels. Just to give you an example of the types of content that people will see on the slide. So we talk about um, the preterm infant, the baby with hyperinsulinemia, and the baby with increased glucose util utilization. And then for the temperature module, we focus on the infants who are at increased risk for hypothermia, the normal response to cold stress, and then we move ourselves towards when the normal response to cold stress fails or the baby is too immature to be able to mount the response and the child becomes accidentally hypothermic. And then we talk about uh, candidates for therapeutic hypothermia and um, HIE, we introduced that concept. And I'll show you a slide on that next. And then how to rewarm babies after they're accidentally cold. So we go through mechanisms of heat loss. This is, again, I'm just showing you a couple slides from each module. Um, so we take conduction, convection, evaporation, and radiation, and break it down into slides that follow. And then this is from the acute perinatal event discussion, you know, where we're trying to describe to people what is HIE, what causes HIE. So there's one slide from that section. And then for unintentional hypothermia, we spend quite a bit of time talking about, you know, that we try to be evidence-based and stable wherever possible, but there are places where there is not good evidence. So it's not ever been studied how to really, how's, what's the safest way to rewarm an accidentally cold baby, especially the really tiny preterm babies. Usually the mindset is to rewarm as fast as you can, get them away from being hypothermic, and, um, and that probably is not the best thing to do. And we talk, we talk about why. So for the airway module, this is the longest module in the program, and we talk about primarily how do you evaluate respiratory distress? How do you tell when baby's gone from mild to moderate to severe distress? And trying to prevent the baby who ends up with severe distress without you having activated increasing levels of support. So I'll show you a slide um, <clears throat> that we use, a, a movie that we use in there in a moment here. But here's an example. We're talking about what is mild respiratory distress, what does moderate look like, and then what does severe respiratory distress look like. And here's a, here's a video of a baby, a 35-week gestation, late preterm infant. And I usually have my students count the respiratory rate to make my point. So just try to take a, a guess what the rate is as we're going. I know you don't have a watch that you're looking at. Yeah, I heard 120, 100, yeah. So you know, your skilled eye can do that, right? <laughs> but when you have people in the class, and we'll like go, okay, get your watch out, okay, we're gonna all figure this out, and then people are like, oh my gosh. So we're like, this is what you know, moderate respiratory distress looks like, and, uh, and so the video lasts about a minute, and there's little subtitles you can see that come, come along. And then shortly after this video was, done, they went ahead and intubated and gave surfactant. So. Okay, so I'll go to the next. So we also have a section in this, um, uh, a, a, theory, a section in this module that teaches people how to interpret blood gases. And I've got the KPA uh, values up there. But, um, so some people use millimeter mercury, some use KPA for PCO2. But anyway, using this Sigurd Anderson nomogram that was published actually in the Scandinavian Journal of Lab Investigation in 1963. So it goes way back when, when we didn't have um, our machines that could do all these measurements, we had to calculate bicarbonate. So using that old scale, I've taken that and helped people, I think, understand what they're looking at. And the goal with teaching blood gas interpretation is that if you can figure out if it's respiratory or metabolic, then you'll have a better idea how to support the patient. Okay, what the correct uh, care would be. And then for the blood pressure module, we talk a lot about shock um, and cardiac output and then physical examination for shock. And then what are the causes of initial treatment of hypovolemic cardiogenic and septic shock. And just to give you an idea, these are all the different things, the different areas that we cross through during the physical exam. So we talk about respiratory rate, uh, respiratory effort color, heart rate, the blood pressure, pulses, perfusion, uh, the heart itself on x-ray, and then urine output. And then for the lab work module, the focus, even though it's called lab work, 
really is on neonatal infection. So we do have a section in there on CBC interpretation as well. And for emotional support, we, uh, I, I really believe that the course is not complete without talking about the huge impact these babies have on families. And all it takes is for us to take the time to talk to, to parents about um, their experience and to know that there are ways that we can, certainly I think we're doing much better than we maybe appreciated in the past, but how we can support them through this major crisis that they're experiencing. Even if their baby's not that ill, it's still major for them. And then quality improvement uh, objectives. So we start the program out talking about safe care, safe patient care, and how to reduce errors, diagnostic and therapeutic errors. And then we round out the program, we return to quality improvement at the end to uh, discuss different, you know, to escalate a little bit more about how, how we can communicate better and how we can work as better teams. And then that was my last slide. Um, I did put a couple pictures here of our beautiful state of Utah, because you've never been there. Uh, it's a very diverse state. So anyway, that's, that's uh, my presentation, and I just wondered if anybody has any questions.